This is Getting to Know Your Bible, a program dedicated to the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's Billy Lambert. It is a genuine pleasure to be with you today on Getting to Know Your Bible. And we do appreciate those of you who've tuned in to watch today, especially if, may, if this may be the very first time that you've seen this telecast. Today, I want you to know that I'm Billy Lambert. I'm the regular speaker on Getting to Know Your Bible. And we're just happy that you're watching today. And, and those of you who watch every time we come on the air, thank you so very much for your support. Now, today on Getting to Know Your Bible, we're going to discuss this theme, a memorial of liberty. You may wonder what that is about. Well, stay tuned as we discuss this from the Bible. I think that you will profit from our study together today. Now, on Getting to Know Your Bible, we offer a free Bible correspondence course. We have literally thousands upon thousands of people who have taken this Bible course, and we want you to be a part of it. We want you to have it. We're not going to charge you for it. There's absolutely no charge. We send it to you free of charge. And anything we offer on getting to know your Bible is, is no cost to you. We want you to pause long enough right now with us to find out more about the course and how you can receive it. To help you in your study of the Bible, we want to send you this Bible correspondence course. This course is non-denominational. It's based on the Bible. It's conducted by mail, and it's free. To receive this course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama, 36580, or call toll-free 1-877-711-5214. I'm reading now from Matthew, the 26th chapter, starting in verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new with you, in my Father's kingdom. Memorials and monuments are natural and universal. All have erected memorials and monuments since the beginning of time. A tombstone is a monument to two things. Someone lived and was loved. Someone died and they are remembered. There are memorials all over the world. For example, if you were to go to Egypt, you would see there the pyramids, which are monuments and memorials of an ancient civilization. You go to Rome, and you go down into the catacombs where Christians worshiped, and when they uh, died, many of them were buried within those catacombs. And it stands as a memorial to the great faith of those who died often for their faith. You also can go to the, to the Arlington Cemetery. And there, that's a memorial to those who gave their lives and shed their blood for this nation. And then you go to the tomb of the unknown soldier. And that is a reminder of those who put on the uniforms of this nation and fought under the flag of this country, and many of them did not come home to their families. Those are memorials. Those are monuments. There's the Washington Monument. There's the Lincoln Memorial. All of those are monuments that are reminders of things of the past. And then there's the rainbow that's in the heavens which is a reminder of the promise that God made to Noah that he would never again destroy the world with water. And then there's the Passover feast. 
that was observed in memory of the time God delivered his people from bondage in Egypt by putting, uh, instructing them to put, put blood on the outside of the doorpost of their house and on the lintel of their house. And God said, when I see that blood, I'm going to pass over you. And they began then every year to observe that Passover feast. Now Jesus was at the last Passover feast. And it, at that last Passover feast, Jesus instituted what we know today as the Lord's Supper. And I just read to you from Mar uh, Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 and following, where he said, he, told, he gave them bread and told them to take, eat. This is my body. And then they took the cup and they said, drink you all of it. All of you drink it. And they said, this is my blood. This represents my blood. The, the bread represents his body. The fruit of the vine, the grape juice, represents his blood that he shed on Calvary. And he said, I want you to drink henceforth of this in remembrance of me. And so this is a memorial feast. Now the Lord's Supper is many things. First of all, the Lord's Supper is a looking back. In 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, Paul is writing about the Lord's Supper. And in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, In partaking of the Lord's Supper, you do show forth the Lord's death. So the Lord's Supper is a looking back to the cross of Jesus Christ and to the death of Jesus Christ. Crucifixion uh, was a very horrible form of death. That uh, The use of a cross for uh, execution was seemed to have come from the Phoenicians and it was barred by the Romans. They seemed to refine it. And Jesus was crucified. He was nailed to a cross as a very cruel form of death in Jesus' day. It was the electric chair of his age. It was a lethal injection of his time. It, it, it was the gallows of his day. The victim would remain on that cross uh, often until they would die of a scorching heat or heartbreaking suffering. And the, they would linger on that cross until sometimes the birds would literally come and pluck the eyes out of their sockets. I want you to picture Jesus on that cross. I want you to picture Jesus with nails in his hands and in his feet, crown of thorns on his head, blood flowing down his cheeks, down all, he's just a bloody mass from the beating he's just received in Pilate's judgment hall. Jesus is on that cross, and Jesus was there until he gave up the ghost. And finally his body was taken down from that cross, and it was placed in the, a borrowed tomb, a new tomb where a man had never laid. And then three days later, Jesus Christ came forth from that grave, triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. Jesus Christ died on that cross and, and, and shed his blood on that cross for the sins of humanity. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are going back to that cross and remembering his death on that cross. So in that respect, it is a looking back. The Lord's Supper is also a looking within. Again, Paul, in writing about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, said, Let a man examine himself, and let him so eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You need to examine yourself. For a man that eats and drinks unworthily is guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. I've heard people say, well, I'm not worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. Who is? Who is really worthy? When he talks about doing it in an unworthily manner, he's not talking about the worth of the individual. He's talking about the manner in which it is done. 
I, I've seen people uh, wait on the table of the Lord uh, to, uh, to have prayer for the, for the bread and for the fruit of the vine. And they do it in such a careless, slipshod way that it was out of character for the solemnity and the sacredness of that which we were performing. So we need to do it in a way that is fitting, a way that is, that is in keeping with the dignity and the sacredness of the supper of our Lord. So we need to examine ourselves and eat of that bread and drink of that cup. We need to do it in a fitting way. But then the, the Lord's Supper, in addition to be a looking back to the death of Christ and a looking within, is also a looking forward. He said, you do show forth the Lord's death till he come. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper until he comes back someday. Now, we do not need the Lord's Supper to remind us that Jesus is coming back because Jesus has already reminded us of that numerous times. In John chapter 14, he said, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus said, I'm coming back. And this is something that we're going to do in remembrance of Jesus until he returns someday. Early Christians observed the Lord's Supper. We find that an example of that being done in the 20th chapter of Acts in verse number 7. Upon the first day of the week, the disciples gathered together to break bread, and Paul preached of them and continued his speech until midnight. And they did that to remind them about Jesus' death, to remind them about the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back someday. We do it until he comes back. Now the Lord's Supper, in addition to being a looking back, a looking within, and a looking forward, is a looking up. If, we, if you will, turn in your Bibles to John the 6th chapter, and we want to read just a few passages of Scripture from John chapter 6, verse 53 and verse number 54. And there we have Jesus saying this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that drink, eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and thy eye in him. Now, there's one observation that I would make about this, actually two. Number one, Jesus is not talking about the literal drinking of his blood or the eating of his flesh. The Lord's Supper does not become the literal body and the literal blood of Jesus. Secondly, Jesus Christ is not talking about the Lord's Supper directly in those verses. That is not what it's all about at all. It refers to the death and to the benefits of that death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by our believing in it and our having faith in his death and our having faith in his shed blood upon the cross of Calvary that we're going to have eternal life. We need to eat his death and drink his death. Have you ever spoken about one of your children? Maybe it's your son, and he loves baseball. He, he loves baseball more than anything else in this whole wide world. And have you ever said that boy just eats and drinks baseball? What do you mean, what do you mean by that? That's his life. 
and our life should be Jesus. Our life should be so wrapped up and tied up in the Lord Jesus Christ that our lives daily are eating and drinking the Lord Jesus Christ and imbibing in Him and the benefits of what He did for us upon the cross of Calvary. We need to have that kind of an interest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes the question arises, when should people partake of the Lord's Supper? And I'm aware of the fact that people in various religious groups have different uh, ideas about that. But, but I want us to look at some things found in the New Testament, things that I believe will help us to, to understand the day upon which we partake of the Lord's Supper. There were so many things that happened on the first day of the week, that is, upon Sunday. For instance, in Luke, the 24th chapter and verse number 1, we learn that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. Now let's keep that in mind. Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. And so there's something special about that day. The day Jesus was raised from the dead. The church of the New Testament began on the first day of the week. Well, if you'll turn in your Bibles over to the book of Acts and chapter 2 and verse number 1, there you'll have the Bible reading like this. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Well, what happened in Acts chapter 2? If you'll notice, if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 2, there are 47 verses in that chapter. From verse 1 to verse 47, we have the history of the beginning of the church in the New Testament. Another way to put it is this is the birthday of the church. And it began on the day of Pentecost. Well, what day of the week was day of Pentecost? For according to the book of Leviticus, the Jewish people were to count seven Sabbath days. That would be 49 days. That would be that, would be that many Saturdays. And on the 50th day after the 49th day, which that would have been on Sunday, the first day of the week, they were to count, they were to observe Pentecost. And it was on the day of Pentecost, the first day of the week, that is on Sunday, that the church of the New Testament had its beginning. And that was the day that the Apostle Peter preached the first recorded gospel sermon under the Worldwide Commission. And that's the day that people asked him what they needed to do. And that was the day he told them to repent of their sins and to be baptized for the remission of those sins. And that's the day about 3,000 were baptized. And that's, that's the day the Lord added them to the church. Verse 47. You see, that was the beginning of the church. When did the church begin? It began on the first day of the week. Now, according to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, the early church observed the Lord's Supper upon the first day of the week. But when Acts chapter 20 and 7 reads like this, Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. So they were observing the supper of the Lord, which is referred to also as the breaking of bread on the first day of the week, on, the, uh, uh, on Sunday. Well, there's something else that happened on Sunday. In 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, verses 1 and 2, we learn that early Christians gave as they had been blessed and prospered on the first day of the week. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week. Let every one of you lay by him in store as, as, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul was coming to get a collection that they were taking up to help a poor people. 
And Paul said, I want you to take it up on the first day of the week. The reason he said that is because they had a practice of coming together every first day of the week and they did not forsake that occasion. Well, there were some that did evidently because in the Hebrew letter they were exhorted not to do that any longer. Verse 25 of Hebrews 10 reads, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So evidently there are some that did, just like there are those that forsake uh, the assembling of the church when it tries to come together today upon the Lord's day. So they, they assembled together on the Lord's day, and they gave as they had been prospered. Uh, so sometimes people say, well, well, what do you think about uh, the, the people and how they ought to give to the Lord? I'm going to tell you what I believe with all of my heart, and it's because I, I've, I've studied this for many, many years, and that is the subject of giving to the Lord. I believe that God's people are to give into the treasury of the local church where they are a member on the first day of the week, and they give it not to the church, they're giving it to the Lord. Uh, someone says, well, the church has all the money it needs, or I'm giving it this to the church. No, you're not. We're to give it to the Lord. We're to give what we give to the Lord on the first day of the week. And the last time I observe, every week has the first day in it. And I've noticed that those who may not observe the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis take up collections on a weekly basis. Well, the same principle that would... Uh, would authorize you to take up collection every first day of the week, that is 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. It is the same principle that would authorize us to observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. Churches of Christ throughout the world commemorate the death and suffering of Jesus Christ every Lord's Day. They do this in remembrance of Jesus. It is easy for someone to be forgotten. We do not want to forget about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Jewish people were told, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, they were not told to remember every Sabbath day to keep it holy. They understood that when they were told to remember the Sabbath day. And every week had a Sabbath in it. That was Saturday, the seventh day of the week. And they remembered every one of them, or else they were in, in, uh, uh, out, of, uh, uh, relation, out of accord with God and, 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 and failing to do what God told them to do. And every week now has a first day in it, and we're to worship God every Lord's Day, every Sunday, not on Saturday, but on Sunday. And we do that to honor God, you know, we need to worship God more, don't we? Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. The world is so proud nowadays, and we need to bow down before our God. And I believe that when we come together on the first day of the week, that the catalyst of our service ought to center around the, the Lord's table where we remember His death and His suffering upon the cross of Calvary. Jesus said, This do, in remembrance of me, Luke tw chapter 22, verse 19. Jesus wants to be remembered. He doesn't want to be forgotten. It is so easy to forget the things we ought to remember. And then sometimes we remember the things we ought to forget. But Jesus said, I want you to remember me. I want we need to remember what Jesus has done. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus purchased the church with his blood. We need to remember that Jesus has been raised from the dead by the power of God. We also need to remember what Jesus is now doing. Jesus is now still saving people that obey him. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. So he's still saving people that are willing to obey him and that love him, enough to obey him. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments, John 14, verse 15. Jesus is still adding saved people to the church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 says, And the Lord 
added unto the church daily such as should be saved or those who were being saved. He's still doing that. So when we talk about remembering Jesus, remember what he's done, what he's doing, but we also need to remember what Jesus is going to do. And someday Jesus is coming back. And we're going to, to continue to remember Jesus every Lord's Day till he comes back someday. He'll come back with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall be raised first. And what a day that's going to be. Right now, you and I are living between two visits of the great God of heaven. One is a matter of history, and the other is a matter of promise. And Jesus has promised to come back someday. That's what's going to happen in the future. But also in the future, Jesus Christ is going to be our judge. He's our Savior right now, and He wants to save us now. And He would save you now if you would render your life to Him. You just give it all up and turn it over to Him. Jesus wants to give you life and that more abundantly. He gives you life through Him. He is the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And real living, real living is not in the bar. Real living is not shooting up some kind of drug. Real living is living for Jesus. It's living for Jesus. I know how we need Jesus today in our modern world. Our children need Jesus today. They need to be brought up in homes that are focused on Jesus. And Jesus wants you to obey Him by believing on Him. He wants you to obey Him by repenting of all your sins, by confessing that you believe Him to be the Son of God, as did the eunuch in Acts the 8th chapter, when he asked, here's water, why can't I be baptized? And the man said, well, you can if you believe. He said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. They, they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And so you, you can be baptized into Christ today. I'd urge you to give your life to Jesus, and then you can meet with the church every Lord's Day. And I'd urge you to visit the Church of Christ in your community, and they will observe the supper of the Lord every day they meet on the first day of the week. May God help us to have a greater respect for the things of God I want to thank you for watching today. Call now for the Bible course. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you is my prayer. Getting to know your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580 or call 1-877-711-5214. Join us next time for Getting to Know Your Bible.